Hello, my name is Dr. Adana Brown and I am the proud Local District West Superintendent. When I was asked to speak at the Class of 2021 graduation for GALA, it was an honor and a privilege to be among such amazing young women who not only knew who they were, but they had goals and aspirations that extended beyond college and career. The vision and leadership of Dr. Hicks and Dr. Michelle King to create a school like GALA not only empowers young women of today, but it also creates stepping stones for more to come. GALA is a place of learning. It is a place of visionaries. It is a place for young women to find out who they are and continue to break those glass ceilings. I wanna say thank you to Dr. Hicks for her amazing leadership. I wanna say thank you to all of the young women who stepped so boldly into a space where they find their voice. Gala is truly that space and thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Hi, my name is Jillian and welcome to the 2022 Launch Her Feature event. I'm currently a junior in the class of 2023 and student body treasurer at Girls Academic Leadership Academy, Dr. Michelle King School for STEM, also known as GALA, the first and only all-girl public school in LAUSD and California. Thank you all for spending some time with us today. You're going to hear from some of my fellow scholars as well as our honorees, incredible women who embody the excellence that GALA teaches us. GALA girls dream big and we are ready to change the world. As a founding student who started here in sixth grade, I am proudly college bound, and I am here because one person has the vision and mission to change the life of public school girls in Los Angeles, and to make sure that we receive top-notch education in science, technology, engineering, and math. Gala's founder and principal, Dr. Liz Hicks. Hi, I'm Dr. Liz Hicks. I'm the founding principal of the Girls Academic Leadership Academy, Dr. Michelle King School for STEM. Happy to welcome you today to our Launch Her Future virtual event. I'm so happy for you to learn about our wonderful school, our incredible students, and our incredible faculty and parents. I hope today you'll be inspired by our students and by our honorees. When I started this school, my idea was that we needed to have equity for the girls in Los Angeles. At that time, Girls could not have access to that model without having to pay large sums of money to a school. I thought it was only equitable that our girls in Los Angeles deserved a public school model for an all girls model, but way more than that, for a STEM model as well. Our girls are getting a great education in the science, technology, engineering, and math so needed in our state of California. In addition to STEM, to have a well-rounded education, we also focus on the humanities and the arts. I'm so proud that in the last two years, we have been able to develop our architecture program that will introduce girls to the field of architecture. Well, where less than 1% of licensed architects are women, African-American women. Our school is more than STEM, however, we have one of the few two-year architecture programs for our girls. We're so excited to see them flourish in the field of architecture as there are very few women of color and particularly African-American women who become licensed architects. We can't wait for the first one. In 2016, I sat with seven teachers, founding teachers of the school. We envisioned what our graduates and this class of 2020, our very first graduate class would look like. It was so exciting at that time to envision as they watched, walked across the stage what they would be doing and where they would be going. And I have to tell you, we did it. Our, 20, our class of 2020, our class of 2021, and now our class of 2022 are all on track for graduating and going on to college. Many will have a full scholarship to the college of their choice. We are so excited that we have provided so many opportunities to our children. 
one of the things that really touched me was after our first graduation, one parent came to me and said, in, with tears in her eyes, I don't think my daughter would have ever graduated from high school, much less gone on to college and with a full scholarship in STEM. She's so excited to go. And although we're sorry to leave, have her leave us, we know she will do great things. This is our dream for every single one of the girls at our school. We can't wait to see them fly. Our class of 2020 and our class of 2021 have flown. They're already in college, they're doing exciting things, and I've got to tell you, they are amazing. One of them has already started a foundation for foster youth, and she was a foster youth. Another has written and produced a documentary on misophonia, a disease from which she suffered. And another one has already published in a scientific magazine with her work on biomedical technology. These girls are incredible and they are so inspired by all the adults around them, particularly the women we are honoring today. Throughout Launch Our Future, you will hear from our students, our faculty, and our parents about an incredible group of inspirational honorees. I'm so happy to announce that Dr. Barbara Ferrer, who many of us have seen nightly on the news, is receiving our leadership award this year for her incredible leadership as a public health professional in our county. The phenomenal women we honor today are an inspiration for our students and we are so grateful for them to agreeing to be our honorees. I'm also very grateful for all the incredible volunteers that we have in our parent body. Our Friends of Gala is an important organization for our school and helps inspire me daily. Our gala parents are my partners in providing exceptional and innovative experiences for their daughters. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rosabel Ruiz, the president of FOGALA. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. On behalf of Friends of Gala, welcome to the 2022 Launch Your Future. I have two daughters here at school, Viviana, ninth grader, and Cecilia, 10th grader. So I've had the chance to observe firsthand what I like to call the gala effect seeing young, timid sixth graders grow into confident leaders throughout their time here. As a mom, it's both humbling and exciting. As a parent who is part of the school community, I am so grateful to all the parents, city officials, and corporate partners who work together to create the environment that makes this growth possible. It truly takes a village. When you walk around our thriving campus, it's hard to believe that not so long ago, Gala was just a twinkle in Dr. Hicks' eye. And now, halfway through our sixth year as a school, so much of our vision has been realized. So today, in addition to celebrating some wonderful, brilliant women, we are also going to take a look back at our first five years and celebrate the accomplishments of our school community. Here to give you a few highlights is my fellow board member, Development Director, Helene Dina. Thank you, Rosabelle. We are so proud that our first two graduating class have 100% graduation rate, 100% receiving college acceptances, and 80% of the students being the first generation in their families to go to college. You'll also be hearing more about our students' achievements in just a bit from our school counseling team. We are living up to our mission to provide opportunities for girls to explore different aspects of STEM they might not normally have access to, including engineering, robotics, and aeronautics. In just our first year, our robotics students place first and third place in the underwater roving vehicle competition they have competed and placed in the first LEGO League robotics competition. This is possible through the generous support of sponsors like the LA Department of Water and Power. In fact, robotics is so popular that we now have three competitive teams. We are also very proud of the unique architecture program we have created, and we're so grateful to the Institute of Classical Art and Architecture which signed on as a partner in our very first year. Only 23% of licensed architects in the US are women, and less than 1% are African-American women. 
Community and corporate partners like this allow us to help our girls expand their views of leadership in STEM fields. In addition to all that our students have achieved academically, they have paired this with developing a growth mindset, which positions them to lead and innovate in whatever fields they choose. None of this would be possible without the support we get from our parent community and our corporate partners. As an LA Unified School District public school, we only get a certain amount of funding to create a world-class education for our girls. So we really need the extra support. And I wouldn't be doing my job as a full gala board member if I didn't mention the donate button right at the bottom of this page. You can also visit www.fogala.org slash LHF. Through this Launch Her Future event, we're looking to raise for forward-thinking, high-quality programs. I hope that as you get to know our students today, you'll consider making a donation so that we can continue to provide a free STEM-oriented education where girls in Los Angeles can blossom and thrive. Now, to share more about our student successes, I'm going to turn things over to our school counselors. My name is Tara Hallinan, and I am the high school counselor at Gala. Counselors are sometimes referred to as the heart of a school, but I like to think of myself as an architect of human development. One of my greatest joys in life is seeing my students every day getting to know them as individuals and supporting them through the highs and lows of adolescence, which we know can be many. The reason I'm able to build these meaningful relationships with these students is because of donors like you, including the incredible parents at our school who have supported in funding additional counselor positions at GALA. The current district ratio for funded counselors to students is one to 750 far too high to be able to provide the necessary support for our students. Your generosity significantly impacts our students' development and inspires the blueprint for me as a counselor to assist each student in reaching their potential. Hi everyone, I'm Becky Gross, middle school counselor here at Gala. I've been at Gala for four years and am simply amazed by the growth of our school. In the few years I have been here, we have been able to grow from just one counselor to three plus a part-time psychiatric social worker. This is all thanks to our amazing donors and generous families who believe in our school and mission. One of our main pillars at GALA is wellness, and I must say that we truly value our students' mental health. Most recently, we have designated the counseling office as a wellness room. With the funding from a $100,000 grant, we have transformed a bland classroom into a peaceful, calming environment, equipped with relaxed lighting, meditation chairs, essential oils. The wellness room is a safe space for students to come and meet with either myself or our PSW, or simply just come and self-regulate and return to class when they're ready. Every school should have a robust counseling team and a room like this, and I am so proud that Gala leads the way for public schools. I am Rose Agamegua. Um, I am actually a founding teacher of Gala. I started um, here when we opened in 2016. Um, I was a sixth grade English and history teacher, and currently I serve as the middle school college and career coach. So teachers, um, teachers at Gala are invested in our students in a variety of ways. We are academically invested in them. Um, we are socio-emotionally socio invested in them. Um, we care about what they do before they come to school. We care about what they do after school. We support them in their extracurricular activities, and we are excited about what's going to happen for them in the future. So we want to make sure that we have bonds that last beyond graduation. I love working at Gala. I love it. There is no other place I would rather be. So my definition of a Gala girl would be a girl who is 
thoughtful, a girl who is curious, um, empathetic, a girl who challenges herself, who pushes herself, a student who doesn't mind making mistakes, a student who um, understands growth mindset, you know, who says, I haven't done this yet. I haven't accomplished this yet. Um, one of the big things that I personally work on, I have an 11th grade advisory and we talk about resilience. You know, it's, it's something that I don't think is innate in people. It's something you have to build. And so I don't know that we're getting them as sixth graders, as the most resilient um, young women, but they get there. And that to me is like the foundation of everything that they are going to be. When I have to think about um, if any of the students here at Gala have inspired me, um, I get very emotional because I don't think, you know, when you're in the space with them, and you're the adult in the room, you don't, you're just thinking about like what you're giving them and what you're giving them and trying so hard to make sure that um, there's nothing you're leaving out. You know, that when they leave here, you're going to have filled all the buckets. Um, and so then sometimes when you're asked a question, you have to stop and think about what they give back to you though. Um, you know, that's a little bit more emotional. So it's a little bit more touching because it's not what you're expecting. Um, I've grown very close to my advisory. I've had these students since they were sixth graders and they are currently 11th graders. And I watch them like right now is like as 11th graders is the point where I've been looking forward to the most because they were going to be applying to colleges, well, programs and thus colleges later on and internships. And some of my students, um, one in particular, I know during COVID especially, she had a very difficult time, um, not so much academically, but with her family, just some things they were going through, um, her dad getting sick and not being able to work. And it was just tough for them. But this girl, she just held her ground. You know, she would show up on that Zoom a lot less of who I knew her to be, but she showed up, you know, and none of us knew. I didn't know for a while that she was going through but later on she shared it with me and uh, just to see how she continued in her academic journey she didn't really let it affect what her overall goal was you know which is to become a doctor and to be an integral part of her environment and her community and um, she knew that that had to continue even though these other outside things were happening to her so that to me was just very inspiring because I can think of especially a lot of girls today, students today, who they would totally use that as the reason why, you know, they couldn't accomplish something or the reason why they had to stop, you know, two miles back as opposed to keep pushing forward. And that's just one story. I mean, I could tell a million, but that one in particular just stuck out with me because I had no idea, you know. And so it just says a lot to me about a gala student because they show up, they show up in spite of other things that may be happening in their lives. Hi, I'm Mr. Molka, and this is my fourth year at Gala. I teach sixth grade math, seventh grade accelerated math, and I also teach aerospace. The cool thing in aerospace is that we learn all of the concepts through project-based design, such as flying drones. Also, the good thing about aerospace is that we look for mathematical patterns and use our math skills to develop our math concepts even better. So not only are they learning about aerospace, but they're also getting math concepts that are very important in the aerospace industry. I gotta say, when I applied at Gala and got the exception to be here at Gala, I won the lottery. The school is so amazing. The students are here to learn and they wanna better themselves as well as our community. In order to be successful here at Gala, the biggest thing is just have fun. Here we are social emotional learners and if you can't have fun, how are you supposed to learn academics? So the first thing that I would say is just have fun and enjoy your experience here at Gala. Hi, my name is Emma and I'm in seventh grade and I'm representing the Aerospace Elective. My favorite projects have probably been the drones where we learned how to fly and control a drone on our own Gala field and it's been so much fun. I really enjoyed learning all the mechanics that are featured in the drone, so the controls and which buttons to press when flying the drone. 
and um, I see this as opportunities that not many other schools have. I want to seize that opportunity and continue learning more about our projects without drugs. One of the coolest things I've done at Gala is teach the Superintendent Carvalho how to fly a drone. Hi, my name is Mirabel. I'm in seventh grade here at Gala, and I'm in the elective aerospace. My favorite part of aerospace was when we started working on this really cool project. When I was working on the wind turbine, um, a piece didn't fit correctly, and so my aerospace teacher, Mr. Mulca, said to try um, a new way and try using it without the piece. So we tried it maybe three times, but it did not end up working. But Mr. Mulca said that there was a lesson in all of this, and that was that even if something doesn't work, you still try it, and that's what's important. Hi, I'm Penelope, and I'm in eighth grade. I'm representing aerospace. Here at Gala, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to collaborate with different people and just learn about the different opportunities I have in my future and the different things that I would be able to go into. What I love most about Gala is all the supportive teachers and students. They're always there to support you and help you when you're struggling with homework or classwork. And I think it's a really amazing community to be a part of. And not many other schools have this much support compared to here at Gallup. Hi, I'm Alika Artis, and I teach Exploring Computer Science here at Gala. At Gala, all of our ninth graders take Exploring Computer Science, and it is our introductory course into computer science. It is our stepping stone to AP Computer Science principles that all of our 10th graders take. In Exploring Computer Science, our goal is to make sure that all of our girls are comfortable with the ideas of computer science, comfortable being behind a computer, coding, programming, designing their own websites, whatever helps them feel more comfortable working with technology. In my class, we make sure that everybody feels welcome, everybody feels that they are capable of doing well and are capable of being a computer scientist. A lot of my students come in feeling very nervous, they have all of these preconceived notions about who can do computer science and what computer science is. And the goal of my class is to disrupt those ideas and make sure that they do see themselves as someone who can do this. A lot of my students at the end of, my, uh, at the, end of the year often tell me, wow, I didn't know that I was capable of coding. Wow, I didn't know that I was capable of making all of these games, all of these websites, and I'm so excited for computer science in the future. The way that computer science works in the introductory course for ninth grade is we think of computer science in general. And what I really try to do is I try to incorporate all of my students' interests outside of STEM in their personal lives into the projects that we do in our class. So yes, sometimes we do make websites, but the websites they make are on topics that are of interest to them. So it could be about music. It can incorporate their own art and showcase some of their creativity and all of the projects that they do, whether it be websites or creating their own digital games. I love teaching here at Gala because I love working with the students here. They are so creative. They are so hardworking and they work together. They support each other throughout all of the work that they do, helping each other with any of the challenges that they have and we always go into all of our projects knowing that we are a team. And I'm always here to support them. They are here to support each other. And I love the community that we've established in our classroom. I'm Amelia. I'm in 10th grade. My elective is engineering. Uh, in that elective, we build many components and it's really hands-on, which is amazing. So rather than being taught and lectured to about how to affect the structural engineering or, and capacity of a bridge, we actually made bridges out of popsicle sticks, which was a great way to learn how different techniques affect the sturdiness and how things work. And there's just so many aspects to engineering, which you can learn about through hands-on experiences. We were testing water to learn about how different sources have different potencies and certain minerals and vitamins. And we did lots of building, lots of structural engineering to learn more about how the world around us and construction works. I absolutely love Gala because it's a very hands-on learning setting and the teachers genuinely care about how you're going to do in school and they will take the time to get one-on-one -on -one attention with you 
and make sure you're doing as well as you can in a class. They genuinely care about how you're doing and it's a really great learning environment to be surrounded by. I came to Gala in 10th grade. I loved the size and I just felt like it was a much easier learning environment and a place where I could get one-on-one -on -one help and I wasn't afraid to ask for it because all the teachers genuinely care about how you're doing and want you to succeed and I'm definitely inspired by them to care as much about my job and be passionate about it because they clearly are as well uh, and they made it so easy the transition and I just really want to be here they make me want to be here hi everyone my name is Anjola I'm a junior at Gala and I'm very happy to be here the best thing about going to an all-girls school is being able to have a sisterhood through which I can thrive in and having being able to create a field that allows women to go into STEM pathways, especially since women are so underrepresented in fields like that. And so going to an all-girls school allows me to funnel my interests and know that I am capable of pursuing any occupation I want to. My career aspirations are in computing. I would like to be a computer scientist. The reason I want to pursue computing is because technology has had such a profound impact on the world and seeing it's how the way it's been able to translate ideas into real life creations pushes me to pursue the field. I think it's so captivating and I just want to pursue it because I think it would really help for me to be able to um, just let my interests grow. Gala has changed my life by allowing me to know that I am not defined by the grades in which I get. It really emphasizes a growth mindset. And coming into Gala, I had rather a fixed one. I believed that I wasn't able to pursue topics like math or computing or engineering because I simply did not have the brain for it. But with Gala's emphasis on a growth mindset, I learned that I am smart and I am capable of pursuing anything I put my mind to. And so it's really been able to change the way in which I approach things, the way I look at things. And I am not, you know, approaching things with no, but rather yet. I've been able to create very valuable friendships that I know will extend for years to come and I've been able to learn so much about myself and about my peers through these friendships and being at Gala and it's really helped me understand the power in sisterhood and you know embarking on endeavors together. Hello, I'm Ms. Thomas and I teach the Architectural Design uh, CTE Pathway. It's a two-year program. Uh, the first year is called Engineering Dynamics and the second year is called Architectural Design. Um, as an extension of the architectural history section that we've been working on, we are going to be modeling Kiragami models of, of, two, of buildings of two modernist architects. Students will be creating the model or selecting the model that they're going to be working on or selecting the building that they're going to be working on and then modeling it um, with a template. And the template is uh, basically a series of lines printed on the back side. So they'll be creating a series of cuts and folds in order to create the final version of the model. Hi, my name is Denise and I'm in 10th grade and I'm representing architecture. I personally really love architecture because of all the possibilities you can have and creating, like using your imagination and creating it into something you can walk and physically live in. And recently in architecture, we've actually been designing um, anything really from name tags to little castles and 3D printing it with our own 3D printer. In architecture, we're using 3D printers where basically we can design anything we want on an online model and we can print it using filament, a plastic filament, and to recreate our design. Gala is allowing me to break not only women like women gender roles in STEM but honestly everywhere with gala I've been given so many opportunities to explore my passion with architecture knowing how there isn't that much diversity in architecture and so um, having all these opportunities is really great and really amazing my name is Yasmin um, I'm in 10th grade and I'm in the elective mock trial. Mock trial has taught me to overcome my fear of public speaking. It's taught me how to be a critical thinker as well as how to form a strong argument. So we were in our second year of mock trial. Most of us had never done mock trial before. We didn't know what a direct examination was. We didn't know what a cross examination was. But we put in a lot of hard work in and out of school. We practiced on Zoom and we eventually were able to make it 
to um, the county finals and we were also state qualifiers. Being in a mock trial has helped me to realize that I want to pursue a career in law and it has really helped me overcome my fear of public speaking and become more confident in myself and what I have to say. Having been here at Gala since sixth grade, um, I have made so many amazing friends here. I've watched Gala grow into the amazing school it is today. I have found that it is so diverse in the perspectives that it really creates such a strong community and anyone can find what they're passionate about. We have eight different sports. I'm on the soccer team and I'm about to go to my game right now. But it's really amazing because there are so many different academic and athletic paths that you can take. So it really allows you to explore a variety of things. I'm John Londa. I teach computer science here at Gala, including the APs. And I'm also the high school robotics coach. Before coming to Gala, I was doing a lot of work in um, computer science equity. And so a lot of that's about trying to get underrepresented groups to be represented in computer science. So that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to come work at Gala, is to kind of continue that work and then just bring it to the classroom, um, try to get you know more uh, females, more um, people of color in computer science. So it's really meant a lot to kind of have that opportunity to uh, teach some of those curricula in the classroom to these students and see some of them go off and major in computer science. I think one thing here at Gala is we give them lots of opportunities, uh, both in the classroom, um, but also through just different partnerships. And I think that's the biggest thing you can do, right, is to give people the opportunities to, um, to kind of like reach out and, and, and go for those things. And I think we've been pretty successful. I mean, you know, we can always do more, but I think we've been pretty successful at you know, offering classes that some schools don't and um, sharing different scholarships and internships that uh, you know that we find and students who are will jump on and they'll be like okay I'm gonna go apply for that give me that letter of rec let's go let's, you know so it's been really exciting to see them um, kind of follow through with those opportunities uh, so the robotics program uh, it's been a lot of fun and there's been a lot of growth there it kind of started with we had a robotics class and we're like okay so what should we do and we just had this group where we decided okay let's go find a competition to do and we looked at different ones and we agreed to do a first tech challenge and we just said okay let's try it out and um, the students were just good about learning new things and um, you know we we're beginners but we try things they don't work out we try something else and learn along the way and then from there it we went from that one team that year to starting a middle school team and another high school team and then we added another middle school team and this year um, LUSD has given us this opportunity to because they're starting a first tech challenge um, league and we were able to get the two middle school teams to participate in that and so right now they're trying to build their robots uh, for that. You know, you put in, the students put in so much effort. It's amazing how passionate they get where they're like, okay, I'm, I need to get this done. Um, can I stay after school this day and work on this? Or can I take this part of the robot home and work on it? Um, and then when things work, you know, you hear them screaming and everyone's cheering and um, they're excited. And you know what? Sometimes things don't work and they're like, okay, we got to sit down and figure this out. We got to fix it and they'll you know brainstorm plan try things and then once again you know things work there everyone's happy and cheering so it's been amazing to be able to experience that to just to see that um that productive struggle and then the celebration when it pays off i think there's a couple things they learn through competition part of it is working as a team which i think is extremely important as they go off into the real world um, you know you work with diverse groups on our team you figure out how to work the best or work together the best that we can and that's a life skill right you take that into whatever industry or thing you want to study and you know you use this, those same skills um, and then of course you know there's the problem solving skills that they learn where you know they can look at things analytically and say mm, this is this is the thing that's not working how do i 
fix that part and how do I test it out and you know improve it and, and keep making things better this whole process you know where they're you know struggling trying things and you know trying to reach success it's all part of the growth mindset that we um, that is a an important part of gala right for everything it doesn't matter the subject we're all, we always say uh, we might not know it now right or we don't know it yet but we will figure it out my name is monica i'm in 11th grade i joined gala at 10th grade and i came here because i have aspirations to computer science in my old school and my community there didn't have any resources to help me with that and at gala they have so many resources even from 10th grade when i first started to even to now one thing I love about Gala is the push of this community that it forms and not just in the classes like I love my math class and my peers in my math class. I love that Gala gives you this sense of community outside of even just your grades but within the whole school. The one teacher that has inspired me the most is my computer science teacher Mr. Ronda. He was the first teacher I had in computer science and he really helped me develop the skills that I need and kind of reasserted that this is something I want to keep doing like in as a career and even now he's like my robotics teacher and now still my computer science teacher he constantly like challenges not just me but my classmates to further our interests whenever we're interested in something having to do with computer science. My aspirations in the future are as a computer scientist I want to go into game development because I think games really have a huge impact on how one can perceive the world. I am so thankful to Gala because I, Especially with the college admissions process as an 11th grader, it's been really helpful to have that, that sort of support and to know that if I ever need help in any class or with just emotional support, there's, that gal is always there with a community to help. I'm a gala girl and I'm college bound. Hello, my name is Tiffany Hervey and I'm the proud college counselor here at the Girls Academic Leadership Academy. Here at Gala, we recognize that each of our students come from unique backgrounds with inspiring stories that are filled with infinite potential and promise. With your generous support and belief in Gala's mission to provide equity and access to promising post-secondary futures for all of our students, we have been able to make our college counseling office a reality and celebrate a 100% graduation rate for our first two senior classes with over 90% of them going on to college and earning millions of dollars in financial aid and scholarships to subsidize our educational goals. It is through your continued partnership and belief in our college counseling practices that we are in the midst of another historic college admissions season and graduation cycle with our current senior class. Thank you for believing in the promise of all of our students and continuing to partner with us to make their dreams a reality. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Hansen. I use she, her pronouns, and I was Gala's class of 2020, and Wellesley College's class of 2024, and um, I am a biology major here. I declared a couple weeks ago, and I absolutely fell in love with biology um, during AV Bio, <laughs> um, freshman year in high school, and I was like, hey, let's explore this in college, see if it's really the major for me or if it's something else. I took a couple courses and I realized that biology was for me, so I declared a few weeks ago. Um, and I want to see that Gala really helped me kind of with um, the whole growth mindset and navigating imposter syndrome in college. Like, I don't feel like I need to have perfect scores every single exam, although I do strive for them. but if I know that I'm not mastering something as quickly as my um, peers, I know I can always ask a professor and be like, hey, I need a few more days or like maybe a week to like really get this down. And I wanna say that Gala is something that really helped me out with that. And coming to terms with, I can learn this. Hello, my name is Delia and I am a current junior class of 2023 and the student body vice president. I've been at Gala since the first year as an incoming sixth grader, a founding student. I'm excited to share my fellow Gala scholars who have the opportunity to have some incredible conversations with our 2022 Launch Her Future honorees. In recognition of the extraordinary circumstances of the last two years, we are shining a spotlight on the heroic work of the medical and public health professionals 
keeping our community safe during the COVID crisis. We're honoring Dr. Barbara Ferrer with the Leadership Award for her dynamic leadership of our city in her role as the Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. So my name's Ella and I'm the student body president for the 2021 to 2022 school year. And um, I'm so, so nice to finally meet you in person after seeing you on the TV screen and my computer screen. And so if you could introduce yourself for the viewers, launch her future viewers at home. Sure. I'm Barbara Ferrer. I'm the director of the LA County Department of Public Health. Uh, thrilled to be here with you, Ella, and your crew. Um, and uh, feeling very grateful that, you know, our data is finally taking a turn for the better here in LA County. So I had the pleasure of meeting you um, in an opportunity that was shared with me by my counselor, Ms. Hallinan. So last, pre last summer, I participated in the Public Health Youth Leaders, PHYL. Mm -hmm. And so for the people at home who don't know what PHYL is, it's a youth internship program that took place for eight weeks over the summer. It was a chance for me to get hands-on experience and learn from public health experts. So uh, th through this process, um, it helped solidify my passion for public health. So for me, I love public health because it has a long lasting impression on communities and our society as a whole. Um, the field also combines what I consider my important core values, which is service, empowerment, and the importance of education. So what do you love about public health and how did you enter the field? Yeah, thank you so much, Ella, and it's wonderful to meet you again. Um, and I'm impressed uh, that you really talked about how much public health aligns with your core values. I think one of the best things about public health is it really is about a value system. You know, it really says that uh, everybody is entitled to have the resources and opportunities they need for optimal health and well being. Um, and it's less about just a, a specific set of initiatives or programs that, um, that we might introduce or that we might administer. Uh, it always carries with it, I think, a justice framework. Mm -hmm. um, it allows you to organize um, so that the conditions. Uh, that help us all thrive are available to everyone, regardless of their race or their ethnicity, uh, their sexual orientation, uh, their sex, uh, where they live, where they work. Um, and at the core for me, that's what's important, mm -hmm. is that what we're doing is we're making sure that we're working together with lots and lots of other people and other organizations to really identify what are the reasons why uh, people aren't as healthy as they want to be. Mm -hmm. So back, I have another question. So how did you enter the field? So yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't have a very traditional route into this field. Um, I started, you know, my career uh, after I graduated from college as a community organizer. I worked around issues around housing, uh, security, economic security, homelessness, um, and then became very interested in uh, sort of being, I, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, to be honest, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to really do international health. Uh, I started, go, I went back to school because I hadn't done a lot of sciences, uh, completed all my sciences, but along the way, uh, met with a group of wonderful people who were public health practitioners. And they were like, why are you, you don't need to be a doctor. <laughs> uh, if you, you know, if you want to do work around creating systems that allow people to get fully immunized or that allow people to have access to food and healthy food. Um, that's what public health is all about. I had never heard about public health. I mean, I'm old, this was a long time ago. Um, but I was very intrigued and uh, went ahead and took a few courses and fell in love with public health. And I think the pandemic brought to light the field of public health for a lot of people. I mean, I took an intro to public health course that was introduced to me by my counselor too. And I, that's where I learned about public health. And I was like, I didn't know that there was a field that combined everything that I loved and was passionate about. And so that's... Yeah, that's exactly how I yeah. felt. Like, wow. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't have to take organic again. Yeah, sorry. I don't have to, you know, like it, it just felt like this really resonates mm -hmm. uh, with what I'd love to do. Um, and, it, you know, it allows you to also work on developing relationships, but fixing systems. It's yeah. less about fixing people. I think a lot of what you do as a healthcare provider is, you know, you get focused on, you know, addressing a disease or, you know, making somebody better. When you're in public health, you're really about, like, making systems work so that people have what they need to be healthy. Which is so important. Yes. And I think so. 
And so something that I learned about you from PHYL is that you um, have a background in education and that was something that really stood out to me. So how do you think that your background in education has changed your approach to public health? Well, you know, I think uh, one of the best jobs I ever had was I was a high school principal uh, in Boston at a district high school. And the reason I, I say it was one of my best jobs, because it certainly was one of my hardest jobs, was because I learned the most. And I learned the most from the students mm -hmm. uh, in, in my school community, who were both amazing people, uh, amazing teachers, um, but also um, were very open uh, to trying to figure out how to best work together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, for me, I think there's not a lot we accomplish uh, when we sort of have to go at things by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but when we come together, it's pretty powerful uh, what the work in front of us um, can do to sort of expand opportunities or give us additional meaning. And I saw that every day at my school. You know, I saw that the ability of students to build relationships with each other, to build relationships with the, with the teachers and the staff, uh, to build relationships outside of school in the larger community was really essential to their development um, and also, I think, uh, empowered them mm -hmm. to take on the important role that each of us has when we're part of a community. And I've seen that in my own school, just the sisterhood that we have together and have been able to come to solve problems. Yeah, which is amazing. I mean, you have, you have this, this great opportunity also um, to recognize that you know the conditions for women are different than they are for men and uh, how important that is um, in, in both finding the strength in that solidarity but also in acknowledging uh, what are the barriers yeah. that really I think you know work both systemically and, and individually um, that make it harder for women to, to be all they can be. So being the student body president um, I manage a school budget for morale building events. I work and facilitate a team of 40 where we collaborate on school and grade level events. So my current position is always uh, pushing my leadership skills. And so I want to know what it's like to manage such a large budget and workforce, because I know mine is on such a small scare scale. Compared to yeah, mine. you know, I think, you know, the, the principles around management are the same, whether it's a small group of people you're working with or a larger group of people, you know, have to build respect and trust. Uh, and, and if you don't start there, you're really not going to be able to accomplish anything, no matter how big your organization is. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, leadership isn't about leading people. Um, and, you know, sometimes it gets portrayed as that, but mm -hmm. I, I don't really think that actually captures what's important about leadership. Leadership is about helping everybody, uh, again, thrive mm -hmm. uh, and contribute to the best of their ability. Uh, and making sure that there's opportunities for all and respect for all. So, you know, it's more like a shared leadership model. And and I think, again, when you're working together with a lot of other people, you got a lot of other talent uh, that you're surrounded by. And that other talent helps make what seems like daunting tasks a lot easier. So I don't do anything by myself at this department. Uh, we are really large. I think our budget right now um, is probably about $2 billion a year. There's probably about 5,000 people who work here. Um, but there's a large team uh, that's involved in, in trying to make sure that we're organized to do the best work possible um, and to address all of the issues that come up with such a large budget um, and making sure that you know we're attending to the needs of a very diverse workforce. Would you ever say that feels daunting? like to? Have that. I think what I, I think the most daunting thing things about you know positions of leadership is the responsibility mm -hmm. um, and you know how personally I feel about like always doing my best and then hoping that my best is also um, appropriate and correct. Yeah. So you know I think it, it's hard in large organizations um, to let yourself take a lot of risks and to let yourself fail. Like, if you're going to take a lot of risks, you're going to fail. Yeah. Um, and in large organizations, sometimes the stake seems really, really high. Uh, but I think it is important to, to remember that, you know, we're, we're all on a learning journey, all of us. No matter where we are in an organization, we all are trying to learn. Uh, and from learning, we grow. And from growing, we're able to bring uh, a new set of skills to the work in front of us. 
and there's no way to, to learn and grow without making mistakes. For sure. And I mean, we have a growth mindset at Kahala. So if you haven't learned something yet, and I know that's definitely helped me in a lot of classes and moving from a mentality of like, I can't do this or I don't know how to do this to uh, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to ask for help. And then even if it's going to take me a little while, uh, every day I'm going to probably be able to see some improvement. Exactly. On behalf of GALA and Friends of GALA, we're presenting you with the Leadership Award for your excellence in leadership in public health. So thank you for all you do and all you've done for Los Angeles and our communities. Uh, you know, really, I'm super honored, but I want to be clear, like this award belongs to all of you as much as it does to me. Um, we've been in this together. It's been a long two years. Uh, nothing I've ever done uh, for these past two years I've done alone. Uh, your support. Uh, your ability to work together, your ability to take care of each other is what actually got this community through the last two years. So I really ought to be giving you all an award for everything you did. Dr. Sonia Gandhi and Ms. Peachy Hain are receiving the Gala STEM Spotlight Award for their tireless work with COVID patients and the many ways they exemplify pathways for girls in STEM. Hi, um, good morning, and thank you so much for coming here today and sitting down with us to answer some questions. Um, my name is Lana, and I am a senior at GALA, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. My name is Michelle. I'm in 11th grade at GALA, and it's a privilege to have you here. Thank you so much for yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Sonia Gandhi. I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Cedars and an Infectious Disease Specialist. And I'm Peachy Hain. I'm an executive director of nursing at Cedar Sinai. So I have a bit of a confession to make. While fully recognizing the tragic human toll that COVID has taken, as someone who wants to specialize in infectious diseases, there is a part of me that has been really interested in seeing, watching it spread. I've read about so many outbreaks and different infectious diseases in the past, so it has been interesting and ed educational to watch what's happened. So you were in charge of the um, unit at Cedar sinai that treated the very first COVID-19 patient. In your career as an infectious disease doctor, how do you balance that scientific curiosity and interest in your field with the knowledge of the human cost that is contained within it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think what I would say is the scientific curiosity probably drives the mechanisms by which we can actually impact that human condition. So I think in any specialty, infectious disease included, but anything in medicine, the purpose that I really see is to try and alleviate and mitigate that suffering and improve that human condition. So scientific curiosity happens to be one of the ways in which we can develop ways to really mitigate that suffering. And I think with infectious diseases in particular, um, I think as we were talking previously, um, there's a lot of public health factors and socioeconomic factors that go into infectious disease. So what makes it distinct as a specialty is not just the science, but it's the integration of the science with a lot of the public health and, and really addressing those other socioeconomic factors to try and ultimately improve human condition. Mm -hmm. um, watching the news throughout the pandemic and seeing how healthcare workers were affected, from patients being jammed into makeshift wards and cafeterias to doctors, nurses, and staff being directly exposed to COVID-19 was really scary for me. What were some of the challenges you both encountered due to the pandemic, and what advice do you have for people like Lana and myself who may enter the field, either as healthcare professionals or researchers? So, I'll let me answer first. <laughs> so, ah, the fear of facing an invisible enemy. You know, we have, de we have dealt with infection control, you know, year in, year out for many, many, many years, but this was so, so different. So we were scared. I was scared for my staff, the frontline staff. Uh, we did not have enough personal protective equipment, you know, um, but we, we, we helped ourselves by looking at the basics, you know, good hand hygiene, uh, wearing your mask properly and wearing other protective equipment. We were scared of um, taking this home to our families, 
you know, I had nurses who ended up staying in the hotels because they would not want to be uh, with their young children and their husbands. Um, I have a 90-year-old mom at home, and so every time I got home, um, I removed everything almost, you know, you're almost uh, not wearing nothing, you know, when you get inside the house because I didn't want to take anything. I did not hug my mom for almost two years because I was so afraid. You know, so these are the things that we were afraid of. And of course, in the early years, of, in the early months of the pandemic, really, there was no cure. There was no medication, no treatment. Um, um, so I was still, you know, I was still very happy that our staff continued to come in to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a dedication to your field, whatever it is. And um, it really helped us a lot. And um, your second question was about how, what would be what advice would you give to people joining right. that company? so this is my two cents you know um if you choose healthcare as a career this is not the first and the last global crisis we will have and infectious disease is really the worst but we learn from each episode you know what to do we were more prepared for the next one a little bit more prepared. So we need a younger generation to really think outside the box and say, you know what, I want to go into healthcare. I want to do research. I want to be a scientist because I want to help, you know, uh, eradicate infectious disease. So we're banking on all of you, okay? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, for me, probably there were there are a lot of frustrations and a lot of the fear that PG outlined. I think probably the biggest frustration of the pandemic was something that many of us that treated patients also saw, but in the pandemic we saw it in spades, and that's really um, around vaccine hesitancy being one of the symptoms, but just fueled by misinformation and the frustration of knowing that we have. Uh, a solution to the pandemic that isn't being taken up um, broadly by certain swaths of society. And that was incredibly frustrating. I think when the vaccine came out, it was an incredible feat of scientific accomplishment and such collaboration on a worldwide level in terms of transparency between scientists that we hadn't seen before. Um, and it's nothing, unfortunately, it took a pandemic to get that collaboration. but. Coming up with a very safe and effective vaccine in the time frame that we did was, um, I, I remember the lightness and the hope that we all felt went while that was being rolled out. And then, to, and then two years subsequent to that, really, or a year since we've had the vaccine, but two years since the pandemic started, just knowing that there were certain segments of society that still were vehemently anti-vaccine was very frustrating. I think what I would say, and this relates to the second question about just advice to take, you know, when I think about sitting down as a practitioner with a patient, um, you always, you can't underestimate human behavior. And what I mean by that is when you're talking to patients about what is the best way forward, you can outline for them, these are the things you have to do to stay alive, to improve your health, to improve your condition. So for example, if a patient came to you with a heart attack, you'd say, it's time to quit smoking, You know, minimize your alcohol, start eating healthy, start incorporating exercise. We know these things are going to work. And yet, why is it that some people don't immediately incorporate that? So you see human behavior really kind of, and sometimes getting in the way of just um, what we as practitioners feel is very obvious. So how do you meet that person where they are? And how do you work with them to really understand where their hesitations are, where are their fears? Why aren't they taking the answer that we know is data and science driven? And so I think that was seen again in spades in the pandemic. And that's what we're seeing. It's just on a much broader level. Why is it that people, you know, for someone like us, where we say there's science, there's data, it's safe. Why isn't that really motivating people to, to take the vaccine and to prevent a lot of needless suffering and, and God forbid death? So I think, I think you can't ever underestimate the factors that may be very deeply seated that go into an individual's psyche around why they may or may not be willing to 
um, to hear you out or be able to be in a place where they can absorb what you're telling them. And when you're a practitioner, it's a lot easier because you have these very deep one-on-one relationships with patients that you develop that are based on trust and respect and collegiality. And I think that's challenged in a pandemic because you have public health experts that people don't know. There hasn't necessarily been a trust established um, where they're relaying these things, but it's really down to the people that know these individuals on a one-on-one basis that have that trusting relationship. Um, to be able to kind of pass on that information. So I think the advice, it's a long-winded way of getting back to your second question. The advice would be just don't forget to meet people where they are if you're a healthcare provider or a researcher and work with that individual to genuinely and non-judgmentally understand sometimes there's very strong religious beliefs, cultural beliefs. They may be misguided, they may not be, but you have to really try and get to know that particular individual and work with them. And certainly as a provider, that takes time, that takes patience, um, and um, that ultimately takes compassion and caring and empathy for that individual. So make that the bedrock of whatever you do. Thank you. Um, So one thing that changed for me during the pandemic was seeing in the news a lot of stories about nurses and about the very difficult and underappreciated work that they often do, often under under underappreciated work that they do. Um, So Peachy, with over 40 years in healthcare, you must have seen so much, and especially as the executive director of nursing at Cedar sinai since 2008. So I was wondering what changes have come out of that time, either positive or negative, and what do you think still needs to happen in the field? Well, um, let me tell you the positive first from the last two years. The positive thing that came out of this pandemic and the fear that it has put into us that Clinicians work together, nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, and I'm not just talking about Cedar sinai across the globe, like um, Sonia had indicated, they work together to come up with novel ideas and um, and to work on. For example, when a patient um, couldn't breathe and they are in the intensive care unit, they have to be um, laying on their back. So they put the tube for them to help them breathe. And uh, for for COVID patients, um, they had a lot of respiratory struggles, so they came up with ideas on how they could put the patient on the prone position on their belly and still have the tube not removed for any reason because it's their airway. And, um, and they found ways to do that. And um, they immediately sent it to social media, into the, into the uh, healthcare field so that other hospitals can, can learn from it and do the same thing because it helped our patients. Another thing that happened that was so positive during this pandemic is that, um, again, the creativ- creativity, the working outside that box that we were always, um, you know, enclosed in, nurses uh, thought of the way of how can we, how can we maintain or um, reduce the severity of uh, the impact of this disease on patients' in skin integrity. You know, patients, you couldn't move them, so, you know, their skin break down. They found ways to do this. And again, we put it out there to the, to the healthcare community across the globe so that other hospitals can, can, um, can uh, you know, um, take advantage of it. Now, in the last um, many, many years, um, so funny because I know probably uh, we were at Wall Street Journal. Um, when I first started at Cedar sinai um, we had some uh, very seasoned physicians who still expected nurses to stand up and give up our seats for them. <laughs> and um, and um, that's not just here. That wasn't just at Cedar sinai It was across the globe, more so in third world country where I come from. Um, and um, it took us a while to really get them to f- know that, you know, we c- contribute a great deal to their patient's care and recovery. And uh, we started the uh, Physician Nursing Collaborative at Cedar sinai At first, it was just fixing, um, you know, the doctors are complaining about a, uh, they can't find their charts, you know, so we asked them, how do you want the charts in the patient unit so that you can access them right away? Um, you know, uh, the prescription pads, we don't know where they are. So I said, well, will it help if it's on the on the furthest, far, furthest uh, drawer on the right side <laughs> as you face a nursing station? Very objective, right? And um, 
we fix that first, and then once we fix the, 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 the issues, the ones that we could fix, then we started talking about relationships, congeniality, how can we work together? You know, the nurses are with your patient for 12 hours a day. You know, they know any acute change in your patient's conditions. So we started talking, and we started it with coffee and pastries. My, my vision was that once we've had that coffee and pastries face to face, it's going to be difficult for you when I call for you to scream at me on the phone. <laughs> my theory worked, right? So uh, it started, um, you know, that kind of um, uh, professional relationship between physicians and nurses. And uh, we did it in every unit so that if Sonia frequent a certain unit, she was uh, encouraged to attend that um, that the collaborative meetings once a month and talk to the staff about what's going on and we're still working on it it's very uh, robust at cedar sinai but we've been asked by other hospitals to help them launch their physician nursing collaborative so i'm very proud of this because nurses have a, nurses are have been um, have been uh, you know put at the level where the physicians really think a lot about what their contributions are to their patient's care. And, um, and nurses feel the same way about physicians. They're, not, they're no longer as, a, as afraid to speak up, and we no longer give up our seats to physicians. <laughs> so it, it's really, uh, it has really changed a lot. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and I really love how you came up with a solution that would help both nurses and yes. doctors and just the thought that you put into it. And uh, that leads me to another question I had, which is how would you encourage other girls to stand up for themselves when they encounter some similar situations? Like when, like, would the doctor is expecting you to give up your seat and things like that? Right. So it takes a lot of guts and, you know, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of talking to one another. I think we need to speak up. That's very, very important. You know, uh, coming from a third world country, again, um, the nurses uh, just did whatever the doctors told them to do. And sometimes the nurses felt, I don't think this is the right treatment for this patient, but they were so afraid. You know, and um, in the beginning here, uh, when I started here, uh, nurses felt the same way. So we had courses for them where, where um, they could learn about speaking up. You know, um, if you have something to say, you know, say it, say it in a way where you're not accusing, you're not questioning the other clinician. Just say, you know what, doctor, um, or another nurse, or a nurse practitioner, you know what, this is the situation with this patient um, uh, in the last 12 hours. Um, would you like to reconsider that, uh, that order? Because the order probably was before the doctor knew what the last 12 hours had been. So um, we are in a profession where you know, mistakes could happen if we don't speak up. So we tell our staff that, our frontline staff, we have staff from um, Asian countries. And again, from um, Asia, most of our nurses are, are, you know, are silent, you know, and um, we had to teach them through practice, through sessions like this, you know, how do you speak up in getting them into the same room as physicians and pharmacists and other members of the healthcare team. We, our organization has started this uh, leadership town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. Some leaders also don't speak up at meetings. And uh, so this, this opportunity to, to raise your concern or voice uh, your concern and uh, bring up your ideas, sharing your ideas at a, at a huddle, really where it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not something that we normally do on a daily basis. This has really helped us a lot. Um, Dr. Gandhi, you talked a lot about how when you volunteered in Tanzania and Peru and India, you saw how infectious diseases targeted low socioeconomic classes, and you mentioned that briefly earlier um, in your response. Uh, COVID-19 really highlighted that here in the United States, I would say, and it, it even hit close to home as many of my family members were directly exposed to COVID because they didn't have the option to work remotely. Um, how did your experience abroad influence your thoughts during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I, so I, um, just by way of background, I had gone straight to medical school from college um, and I had come from an Indian family where the British education system was really uh, what the norm was. And what I mean by that is just um, undergraduate education was compressed. So you'd go straight after two years of college into medical school. 
And so there was uh, a pressure to kind of get, quote unquote, get through your training and become a physician. And that was uh, anathema to me. I, I really wanted to experience the world. I really wanted to see other cultures, experience other cultures, really be able to volunteer and practice in your epitome of very rural clinics. And so that time abroad, I had taken several years off in my medical training and volunteered abroad um, and traveled. And that was uh, profoundly transformative, just professionally and personally. And I think, um, I think in addition to the COVID pandemic, but just throughout both professionally and personally, it really grounded me in a perspective that um, became part of the fabric of who I was. And I think it had always been there just being born to immigrant parents, even though I was born here, but it really just strengthened kind of a global perspective of issues. And so particularly with regards to the COVID pandemic, I think just um, no matter how bad things got in LA or at Marina Del Rey Hospital, which is where I was, I always tried to remember how fortunate we were in that we were in a place that had supplies. We were in a place that did have PPE. We were in a place that had medications, treatments, and obviously vaccines when once those were developed. Um, and that was not necessarily the case for a lot of the world. And so there was always kind of a grounding perspective for me to say, you know, things can always be worse. And um, it was important not only to be proactively grateful for what we did have, but to remember that we had a lot of work to do in terms of the inequalities and inequities globally. Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that really helped me cope, like during the pandemic, just knowing that it was so much worse in other countries. like. Um, and that we had access to the vaccine and so many other things. And um, did that help you out, like just with all the negative things that came from the pandemic? Like, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, being proactively grateful and remembering, even in the midst of chaos and at the worst of times, that we're fortunate. I think that's probably a lesson that can be applied to life in general, even beyond the profession. So I think... Uh, certainly, anytime you have a global perspective, it just highlights certain inequities and justices, and then it motivates one to hopefully do better and try and address those. But it also motivates you to be, again, proactively grateful, which I think is um, which is imperative to just living a good and fulfilled life. And that really leads to what Sonia had said earlier about the frustration, because we see this every day, and um, the. We have vaccines available here in the U.S. and uh, not not everybody is taking the vaccine. And these are the patients who end up with severe disease and end up in a hospital and uh, and go through so much suffering. And if you know the suffering is for the patient, they cannot even have the human connection because they can't have their family there to hold their hands. Uh, they can't see their family. They can't talk because they're all intubated. And um, and um, the suffering for the nurses and the physicians who could end up getting the disease because they're they are in this situation day in and day out. A lot of our clinicians were working 20 hours a day, coming back the next day. You know, it it, it was such a struggle. So you can imagine the frustration on uh, from us who are in healthcare. Why can't people just? take the vaccine and all of us can live better, fruitful lives. You know, so that's where our frustrations have been. Yeah. I the think, most, the most frustration. Yeah, how like personal choice can affect yes. you and your family. Yes. And everything. Mm -hmm. Can I can I go back to a question that uh, that you had asked Michelle if I could reverse the script just for a minute you had asked about um, girls and just you know any kind of advice in terms of speaking up and so much respect for Peachy coming from a different country and just fundamentally changing the way medicine was practiced and the way we interact in the health system but but I would just say you know again mirroring what Peachy said, just just be humbly confident. And what I mean by that is just don't ever kind of have the confidence in yourselves. If you see something that you want to say something, just, you know, don't don't ever let other people question and you can do it in a respectful, collegial way um, and be humble at the same time as being confident. So be confident in whatever it is that you're seeing and need to say, but um, express humility in that you can always learn as well. It's so amazing to be able to talk to you two, just strong women, and yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so this is a question that goes back a bit to what you were talking about um, with global public health. Um, but it also, so climate change has really become the defining issue of, I think, our generation. Um, I personally believe that there is capacity for a lot of positive change, but we, regardless of what we do, we are going to see a horrific environmental and human toll. And it, that includes um, in infectious diseases and public health. So I'm curious how you see climate change and other ecological problems impacting that field. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, unfortunately, my generations and generations prior have really kind of presented your generation with quite the challenge, unfortunately. So, um, you know, we look forward to kind of the infusion of solutions from your generation. I think climate change is a huge impact. It's going to have and has had, actually, as, as you probably are aware, a huge impact on the spread of infectious diseases. So how are the ways in which those two realms kind of intersect? So um, just with rising global temperatures, uh, we've seen a different um, spread of certain mosquito species. So the uh, mosquitoes that spread malaria, that spread dengue, that spread Zika. Just in my lifetime, over the decades, we've seen that um, because of the rising temperatures, we've seen the spread of that disease um, now in the United States and southeastern United States, which was not the case when I was in medical school. So that's just one way. Um, I think global climate change um, and just the impact on water and how, um, how water is impacting just land boundaries, that's also changing the way and impacts how certain vectors of disease and certain vectors of infectious disease where they're present. I think urbanization and the kind of move to um, urban environments all over the world, that's also impacting the spread of infectious diseases. All of these things are connected. And so I think you're absolutely right. We can't think of these solutions in silos. So a solution to climate change is also going to impact global public health and infectious diseases. And so I think um, you're already ahead of the game in your generation by recognizing those connections and recognizing that the solution and all of these problems are interconnected and so that the solutions also have to be interconnected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, so. Um, Peachy, so I, I've grown up in an immigrant family and I'm an immigrant myself and I've often felt like I wasn't knowledgeable in the subjects that I should be in in order to be successful in this country. As a successful immigrant woman yourself, do you, do you have any advice for myself and others seeking success in the United States? Yes, you are successful here. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you that. Well, um, let me put it this way. So coming from the Philippines and uh, you know, working here in the U.S., to me, it was such a privilege. It was such a privilege. I cried every night the first three months. I was so homesick. I used to tell my dad, Dad, please send me a, a money to so I can fly back home. I can't stay. I can't stay here. We were used to the little, um, um, having the life in the Philippines was so different from what it is here. Today, you, I couldn't go back to the Philippines and live there. I will go and visit, but not live there. But as an immigrant, let, let me tell you a little story here. So I was I was fortunate enough that our uh, CEO at the time was teaching, lecturing on uh, leadership. Uh, he had a, le a leadership development program. And I was fortunate enough to be chosen as one person who can attend his program. And there were, I think, 19 other um, um, leaders that attended, but they were all physicians. So I felt like, oh my God, this is such a privilege, right? So in one of the in one of our sessions, that same question came up, and I said, well, you see, when I first came here to the Philippines, in, in spite of the fact that our medium of instruction in schools in the Philippines is English, I felt inadequate. I felt like my accent. My accent was going to deprive me of that um, of that ability to go up the ladder and become a, a, an executive leader, so on and so forth, which was really my dream because I knew very early in my life that you know I can lead, but I just need the forum to do it. And so I said to the to the group that you know I attended courses in conversational English. I said it hasn't helped me much, but you know I, I recognized that I needed to do something. And this wise man in the group said, Peachy, don't be ashamed and try not to lose your accent because it does not define who you are. 
What defines you is where you are today with your passion. The CEO has recognized that you have uh, the ability to lead and take us to where we need to go, the outcomes we need to reach. And, um, and when you speak up, then leaders will, it will be wise for them to just listen to what you're saying, you know, and, and implement programs that will help the organization. From that time on, I said, well, yeah, I have a Filipino accent. What can I do? You know, it made me feel more confident, you know, but being immigrants and I don't know, I'm considered a person of color. I, there has been this notion that, um, you know, you never get to top positions. There's always that glass ceiling. Um, but I always think that, okay, if that's the case, then we will have to work hard, 20 times harder than our comrades, right? Well, what's wrong with that? Maybe you learn more, you, you, get your, um, you, you get more educated, you get more experience that way. So nothing should stop us from trying to reach our dreams or even from dreaming for now. For you, you're, you're young adults, you know, just dream. And uh, just remember that it should not stop with dreams. You know, no matter where we come from, you know, there's always that door that can open us to where we want to go. It happened to me. So, Amazing. because I always speak up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I always, you know what, I remember Tom Hanks uh, had written <laughs> something about mentorship. He was in one of the sets and, uh, and um, he was getting annoyed and everything else. And, you know, he did not even want to contribute or something to that effect. And this was so long ago that I read it, but I, it still comes to mind. Um, the lessons he learned were show up on time, do as you are expected, and share your ideas. Never put it, leave it here because, okay, they might not listen to me because I have an accent, or they might not listen to me because I'm just this person. We're not just, just. You know, we're human beings and we're here for humanity. So if you speak up, you increase your confidence and people will look at you and say, gosh, she's got something to say and worthwhile. I love that. I love hearing the optimistic yes, side of it. You have to. Yeah. And look at you now. Now you're leading yes. in Cedar Sinai. Yes. Yes. And really I love inspiring. what I do. I yeah. love what I do. The yeah. people that I you know that I mentor. So that's inspiring. Can I just add one thing to that? I would just say there's always value, which even if the perspective may be different. So if you come from an immigrant family or you're an immigrant yourself, you have these unique experiences that the rest of us do not and a unique perspective that we may not have. And there's value to that. Yeah. And there's one more thing I forgot to say, what you brought it to my mind, you know, um, especially in healthcare, we really need to know uh, how to how to communicate with the different people of the world. Mm -hmm. We all have different cultures, you know, and we have to respect those cultures. I think it's so it's so missing in today's world where you know we're just talking, talking. But if if you know uh, the culture of that person that you're dealing with, then you'll be able to render more respect, more courtesy, and deal with them in a in a in a better way. So we we need to start looking at different cultures. That might be something for your studies, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you had mentioned a bit about the steps you took to get to where you are now and not being always entirely sure. And that's something that really resonates with me. Um, being at a school like Gala that has very high expectations, we are presented with so many opportunities and not nearly enough hours in the day to get to even a fraction of them. So what I'm curious of for both of you is what opportunities have you had that were really valuable? And then are there any that you turned down that you end up wishing you had taken or even swapped out with something that maybe didn't provide what you thought it would? So what, which of those steps you took maybe worked and which ones would you change? Yeah. Okay, let me start this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, um, the opportunities that landed me where I am. Um, but first, let me tell you that I, I was managing two surgical units at Cedar Sun. I've been in Cedar Sun for four years, so all I can talk about is Cedar Sun. <laughs> um, I was managing these two surgical units, and and I never wanted to leave. You know, I said, why should I leave? It, this is Disneyland. 
you know, my two units were had the highest, uh, well, very high patient satisfaction, physician satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and our our outcomes were, you know, so great. And I said, well, you know, this is Disneyland. I don't want to leave. You know, so I stayed on in that position for 12 years, and um, and then I realized it's time for our younger people to lead. But I felt like I ha I was able to uh, to groom them for for becoming uh, uh, managers. So I had four um, charge nurses, and they were all um, I knew they were all prepared. So when I took on this new role 12 years later, I did not even um, uh, hire a manager for them because I knew each one of them could handle it. And besides, my secondary um, uh, reason for this was that if I didn't like my new job, I can always go back to the old <laughs> job. So you always have to have a plan B. Anyway. Um, but uh, now I'm, I'm in this role, I really uh, felt this is my niche. This is where I need to be because now I'm able to mentor young leaders and, um, and uh, get them out of their shell. You know, I, t I keep telling you every day, you've got so much here, but you're afraid to bring it up. You've got to speak up. You know, you've got to learn to speak up. And I show them the way. And um, I wish that I had this opportunity many years ago. But again, those opportunities that we waste. Um, I did not get my master's degree until I was 50. And you know why I even got it? Because I was signing reimbursement uh, uh, forms for my staff who were taking the master's degree that Cedar Sinai was paying for. I said, <laughs> why don't I take advantage of that? I'm glad I did because you know what? Today, to be able to lead, you've got to advance your uh, your your um, your learning. You really need some doctorate uh, degree in order to lead uh, the now and the future in healthcare. So those are the things that um, uh, are, were opportunities that you know were good for me, and the ones that were not so good because I missed those opportunities because I was so happy with where I was now. What, would I, what am I telling young people nowadays and young leaders? You know what I tell them? If for, for the field that you choose, let's say in healthcare, because that's, that's what I can talk about. You know, don't stay in one role for more than five years. You've got a network. You have to go out there and you've got to be a jack of all trades because the future really requires leaders to be a jack of all trades. You need to know almost everything. And it is such a... Uh, it's it's a good uh, experience. It's it's good for you to have that vast experience. You know that you can. You know, one day uh, we're having financial issues. You can delve in, right? Mm -hmm. And another day it's infectious uh, disease. Well, I was a nurse and we did this on and so forth. So there's several things that you can do. I hope that answers partly your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um, I think looking back, I think. There's a couple of generalities I'll say, and then I can give specifics about my experience. But I think similar to what Peachy said, there's opportunities that present um, at the most unexpected of times and places. So I would say to keep your eyes and ears open for those opportunities. I think for me personally, um, I grew up in a family where medicine was uh, very much frankly expected. I think my, my mom was an OBGYN. I had a lot of aunts and uncles who were in medicine. A lot of my cousins went into medicine. And I think so for me, I almost had an opposite experience where I was kind of channeled to a certain profession. I certainly don't regret it. And I think it resonated with my desire to want to do something to improve the human condition. Mm -hmm. To go back to your first question. I, I think, um, and and that you know prompted me to take several years off to be able to experience other things beyond just kind of um, the education piece of medicine. And I think I ended up with a very circuitous path. So for me, you know, I thrived in uncertainty in a way, which I think is probably not the norm amongst a lot of physicians who tend to be very type A and mm -hmm. want to know exactly what's happening. And so I think for me. I, I welcomed that and um, I would really take the time to try and, and think about my next steps. And so, you know, I went through kind of the traditional training. I took a lot of time off. I did my infectious disease fellowship and my master's in public health. Um, and I really thought I wanted to go abroad and pursue global public health. And um, I had lots of opportunities to do so through the CDC and um, working with the Ministry of Health, for example, in South Africa. And I didn't take those opportunities. This was in my early 30s. And I think at the time, 
Um, there were a lot of other factors for me, like my family and my father was sick at the time with cancer. And so I think those are opportunities that I do still think about. I think global public health is something that is I'm very passionate about. And so I think I'm older now to recognize that, you know, I will get back there in some way, shape or form. And those opportunities will present themselves to me. But it's it's trusting trusting that even when it seems like you're not on a direct path so to to kind of think about your situation you're presented with all these opportunities it's okay to not know exactly what your next step is and to be open to all of the breadth of opportunities that you're presented with and to make the best decision you can with the information you have at the time and to know that you can pivot and i did that multiple times where i was in academics, kind of the traditional path. I practiced infectious diseases. I went then went on to lead a nonprofit, um, which was a big change from a lot of my colleagues in New York City. I did a lot of writing and medical writing. And then I very circuitously came to Marina Del Rey Hospital and ultimately Cedar sinai So to get to Peachy's point of just experiencing a lot of different things is not a bad thing and being open to a lot of different opportunities and not necessarily being concrete is not a bad thing. So um, just being open to the opportunities that present themselves and being comfortable with a little bit of uncertainty is important. Yeah, that's a good reminder for, I think, a lot of us yeah. in our generation who have, yes. and especially very high expectations, lots of options. It's a good thing to remember. Remember that quote, I think, from Tolkien, right? Not all that who, not all who wander are lost. And mm-hmm. it's okay if you have a little bit of time to figure out what it is exactly where you want to land. All of those experiences you're going to draw from, and it's going to give you that jack of all trades. It's going to create all those skill sets that you need wherever you're going to end up. I, there's no final destination. So, you know, just remember, I think, and I'm still, of course, you know, not to say that I am this old, wizened, 80-year-old woman, but life is life is a journey. And so you may not end up, as Peachy was saying, you may end up just evolving and moving from one thing to another. You may end up staying in one industry and one job, and all of that is fine as long as you're getting fulfill, fulfillment from it. And so... Um, I think it's it's just another way of saying take opportunity, learn from every every kind of experience you have. Mm-hmm. Thank you. It's really reassuring to hear how like you don't have to follow a straight path. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Most leaders do not. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had another question for both of you, which is. Um, when I first started gala, math was like definitely my least favorite subject. And after being in my math teacher's class for one semester, I began looking forward to math class each day. And it, I think it's because my teacher's commitment and love for math really influenced me. Like I, it was, it was so much that I was even planning on being a mathematician for some period of time. And though that's not my career go- career goal anymore, um, I'm thankful that my skills and enjoyment for math were nurtured. I was wondering um, if there is a teacher and an individual in your life that has influenced a passion for an unexpected topic or subject, and how does it affect your career or personal life now? Yeah, okay, I, I, can, <laughs> I can start, sure, no problem. So I would say um, there's two people that come to mind. One um, is a history teacher that I had in high school in 10th and 11th grade, and he taught AP history. And similar, it sounds like, to your math, teacher. Um, His love of history was contagious. And, um, you know, I mean, let's, let's be honest, history is not exactly a (laughs) thrilling, engaging, at least that's how I was approaching it. But he sparked curiosity, he sparked debate. And this is what I remember is he encouraged us uh, to question history also, to question the way things were written. He encouraged debate in a respectful collegial way. And I think that um, those that skill set of just being curious and questioning things and being able to debate with others, um, I think that was uh, incredibly important and being able to do that respectfully. And I think, um, you know, I think we can say, unfortunately, society seems to have lost some of that and how polarized we've become and the inability to talk to others in a respectful, collegial way if they have differing opinions from you. I think that that's, um, 
really important. And so I think about him and I think about the love I had of that class. That was my favorite class. And I never in a million years thought I would ever say that. And then I think the other individual I would say that's much more expected is my mom. We all have, we all have um, people that have um, obviously been incredibly profoundly impactful to our development. And uh, my mom grew up extremely poor in India, uh, worked very, very hard, um, and um, was an OBGYN here in the United States. And I think similar, it sounds like a lot of similarities to Peachy and just the rise. I, you know, my mom walked into um, dean's offices and asked to be admitted to their residency class with an accent as the only woman in um, their classes, but she was confident. She was confident in her own skills. Um, and I think she really imparted to me the value of that global inequities and really just um, addressing the need for that. And particularly, specifically, and something that really resonates with me about this, this um, setup is just the need for education of girls and women in places that where it may not be encouraged. And she's um, committed herself to doing that in India. And that's something that's very important to me. So she's definitely someone that's influenced me uh, profoundly. Right. So, so many, many moons ago, but I still remember so distinctly. I was in high school and I was enjoying my high school and uh, time to talk about college. Okay, your parents sit down with you. And so I told my parents, I want to, I want to study. So I become the UN ambassador, uh, the Philippine ambassador to the United Nations. And my dad said, uh, do you know what kind of job that is? And I said, no, I just think it's an important job. And seriously, that's how I, I think it's an important job. So right there and then I wanted to be important, you know, and, uh, so my mom says, uh, no, you're going to study nursing because there's no future for you here in the Philippines. When you graduate, you'll go to the United States and work as a nurse there. That's where your future here, you don't have future. And you know what? Whether my mom had a crystal ball or she knew um, she just wanted the best for us, which I think she wanted the best for us, you know, you do what your mom tells you to do. You know, our parents were, were ruled our lives, you know, um, and but they gave us the chance to to speak up, to defend our cause. But then ultimately, whatever they decided is what we went with. So um, I went into nursing and um, and from the probably after the first semester, I, I started to enjoy nursing and um, I had a um, the second uh, person who made a big difference in my in my work life. Really, is uh, one of our professors. Um, I come from a, a, the college of nursing that I went to. Were all run by by nuns, and they were all nurses. And um, and I remember um, the first time that we were in clinical practice at the hospital, and this nun, Sister Lumen, we called her. Um, shouted down the hall, he says, Patricia, that's my legal name, by the way, Patricia, but I prefer to be called Peachy. Patricia, Patricia, where's the fire? And I said, what fire, sister? You're running around like there's a fire all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get that energy somewhere where it's going to be productive. And, you know, she gave me projects, she gave me programs, you know, I, I, was, I was choreographing a, a dance and I was uh, directing a program and, uh, you know, a, a, a singing group and not related to my nursing career, but it helped me grow. And I knew that, you know, given a chance, I could be a leader. So that's the you know second person in my life. Then when I started working here in the states, um, um, a nursing supervisor took an interest in me, and um, she said, "I see the potential in you, and I will mentor you." And you know, I can I will never forget that time. You know, she was about two years that she kept. Okay, now it's time to sit down and uh, go to more difficult you know uh, things to to handle, and that's. Human resources is always the most diffi <laughs> difficult uh, thing to handle in any job, and um, so. But th at the end of it, you know, um, I I thought I had a mentor in my the last uh, twenty years. I thought I had a mentor who was looking after my my uh, my future. But I think because I did not want to leave Cedar Sinai, you know, there's really no upward movement for me. But you know what I. Always think, you know, 
things happen for a reason. You end up where you are best at. And I feel that, you know, I'm the best at where I am today. And again, it's because I'm able to, to, um, to mentor the young leaders of today, who's going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And hopefully they'll guide frontline staff who's going to take care of me when I'm old and gray and sick. <laughs> so that's my story. It's, it's really interesting to hear how like one person can have such a profound impact in your life. And yes. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for sitting down with us. And it was so interesting to hear about your experiences and the advice you have for us as people who are entering a future in the healthcare profession or even women going into any other field, especially in science. Um, we really appreciate your insights. So thank you so much. It was so inspiring to hear you guys talk to us. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you. And a privilege to be here. And uh, we hope this is just the beginning. And uh, hopefully Sonia and I will be so willing to, to mentor more of you. Anytime. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're the ones who are very honored. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to present the STEM Spotlight Award to Dr. Sonia Gandhi for her excellence in STEM. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you. We would love to present the STEM Spotlight Award to PG Hain for her excellence in STEM. Thank you. This is truly an honor. These three amazing women have helped to ensure that it was safe for me and my friends to return to school and have been inspirational teachers for life's larger lessons, compassion, resilience, and ingenuity. Hello, my name is Karen and I am a current sophomore class of 2024 and class vice president. When Dr. Higgs first started GALA, she met with many women in the computer science field, knowing that, especially in California, the technology world was missing the diversity of thought that young women could provide. One of the women who inspired Dr. Higgs to develop such a strong computer science foundation at GALA is Ruth Farmer, who we honor today with the Launch Her Future Award. Ms. Farmer is the former leader of the National Center for Women in Informational Technology, as well as Computer Science for All and the founder of Last Mile Education Fund. Based on Ms. Farmer's vision and advocacy, all GALA students take computer science in 6th, 9th, and 10th grade, and electives are offered for other grade levels. I learned so much listening to this conversation, and I know you will too. Hi, I'm Anjola Pajemassine. I'm a junior at Girls Academic Leadership Academy. Please, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ruth Farmer, Tech Inclusion Advocate and Founder and CEO of the Last Mile Education Fund. It's an absolute honor to sit with you today. I vividly remember the time I developed a passion for computer science. I was in the seventh grade and I was asked to join my school's coding club. Immediately after becoming a member, I was captivated by technology's ability to improve life and to translate ideas into real life creations. I'm curious as to what sparked your interest in technology and what prompted you to pursue your work as an advocate for diversity and inclusion within the tech sphere. So the root of my work is actually in feminism. And I remember being in college and going to take a class called Rhetoric of Women. And I was astounded to be learning as a sophomore in college about all these women who were incredible contrib contributors to society and history. And I had never heard of them. How had I never heard of them as a sophomore in college? And so that kind of sparked that. And then I got into the workforce and I was actually working in a technology company and I kind of like learned to think like an engineer and speak engineer and I would see the machines we were building and think like, well, this could be modular if we did this. So I like, I felt like I had that brain. And so I got an opportunity when I was working at the Girl Scouts that um, I got this opportunity to start a program with Intel and the Girl Scouts related to girls and engineering. And I was like, well, here's feminism and I care about that. And here's the one place in the business world and in the world we live in that women are not present in the design and engineering of the technical world. And so that kind of married my passion for feminism with a way that I could not only make the world a better place because women's voices would be represented, but also make sure that women made money and had great careers that were gonna help them be independent and um, bring their innovative minds to the world. I think that's beautiful. 
One of the things that we emphasize at Gala is having confidence in using our voices and developing the belief that we all have something valuable to add to the world. And that's a skill that you've clearly mastered, whether that be launching the aspirations and computing competition, a competition I participated in, or creating Tecnolochicas, your efforts within the tech sphere really show the power of utilizing your voice for advocacy. Are there times during your journey where you felt as though your voice was being suppressed? And if so, how did you amplify it to create the change that you wanted to see within the computer science field? Um, I feel like um, I'm a pretty hard person to suppress. And um, my background, I moved a lot growing up, so I was the new kid over and over and over again. So I learned how to navigate new situations and make myself heard because of that. And when it came to, you know, aspirations in computing or technology or any of the things that I've built, I saw a gap mm -hmm. and I was like, this gap needs to be fixed or yeah. filled. And, um, and I've got a, a strategic way that I can get that done. But I think when you feel like you're not being heard, the best choice to mitigate that is to find others, like build networks, connect with other mm -hmm. people. Um, eventually you're gonna find somebody who gets it, mm -hmm. right? And people are resistant to change. So if you're proposing something radical, the key is to not only say, here's what the change should be, but here's how I think we can get here. Because just saying this needs to be different doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. Saying, here's the five steps for this to be different, and here's what it's gonna look like when it is different. Being a student at Gala has allowed me to find my place within STEM. In fact, if it weren't for the school, I wouldn't have been able to come across the Valuable Network, speaking of networks, that is the National Center for Women in Informational Technology, an organization for which you served as a Chief Strategy and Growth Officer for. Being a part of such an incredible group of STEM-oriented individuals, specifically computing, has really been able to show me the power of utilizing communities as a way to connect with others. Have you ever felt alone in this field? Um, I don't think I don't think I feel alone um, because I have built networks mm -hmm. and one of the things I frequently like to share with young women like you is how important networks are um, from a research perspective women actually have bigger stronger networks than men do but women don't feel like they can exploit them in the same way so what I mean by exploit is you know if you're friends with another person and they have a business and you say, hey, let's make a deal together. Women don't typically take make those asks. And so I encourage young women to build a network, build it strategically and thoughtfully and authentically, and to um, use that network when the time comes. And the other key thing about networking is you have to bring something to the table. And so important people, smart people, famous people, they actually want to help you, especially young people like you. You need to give them the tools to help you. So one piece of advice is when you ask for something, um, make it so easy that I could just, on my phone, forward it to the right person. So ask clearly what you need and why and what you're gonna do with that information or that connection. The other thing is you should always treat networking like improv. Mm. So you know in improv, you never say no. Yeah. You never like kill the skit. You say yes and. Well, in networking, if you're standing there and somebody's like, boy, I really need someone who knows Java. I'm doing a project. Your answer is, I know Java. I really wanted to learn Java. Maybe I could do it. Or my friend Sarah is great at Java. You either be the resource or offer the resource. Even if that connection doesn't work out, they will go, you know what? Angela is somebody who seems to always know people. She seems to be a resource. And that's how I've built my networks in that I naturally connect people whether they know they need to be connected or not. And eventually that pays it forward later. Thank you for that advice and giving my peers and I when it comes to like networking and building effective networks. Technology touches nearly every single part of my life from whether it's how I learn, to how I socialize, to ultimately how I function. As someone who has had a front row seat in both observing and shaping the changing role of technology, including serving as a senior policy advisor for tech inclusion at the White House, how has tech impacted the way in which you see the world? And has there been a specific project that has saved such views? So being at the White House and being on this team that was working really hard to make government work better for everyone and to make the world better for everyone was incredible. And um, 
you know, I've been working on computer science education and inclusion and diversity since probably 2005. I've been working on girls in STEM since 2001. But getting to be there at that level in the White House where we were working on policy in levers within government that serve hundreds of thousands of people, right? So if you fix something for, say, how you enroll in veterans benefits, that's going to benefit thousands, hundreds of thousands of people forever. And um, so being in the White House with my team there, we were able to launch something called CS for All, which was President Obama's computer science initiative. And I joined to take that forward. And so my proudest accomplishment there among many other great things that we did was that we, um, we had a commitments process where we invited people from the community to make a commitment to computer science education, like organizations. And when I joined, they had maybe 50 organizations that had made commitments, and they were the usual suspects like Apple and Microsoft and Oracle and others, and the Girl Scouts and so on. But by the end, we had 543 organizations making commitments, which were going to serve millions and millions of people. And so it's really been an honor to be part of building that community nationally and that movement because, um, you know, it's pretty recent that computing has been available. You know, we've had 100 years to figure out how to teach math. Yeah. Computing is relatively new. And so we were really working hard to accelerate getting it into the schools, getting it into the out of school time, making sure that parents understand it, that the media is telling the right story, all the ways that we need to normalize computer science for all kids, not just for some kids. And it should just be as mundane as taking any other class. It should be part of your life. Yeah. I can see how teamwork was really, really instrumental in you helping to make computer science as normalized and as, you know, implemented in every single facet of society as possible. And I've shared similar experiences when it comes to building projects. I want to always, like, use a team to incorporate a diverse range of perspectives. Being in a field as rigorous and as introspective as computer science can naturally engender feelings of inadequacy or incompetence. Imposter syndrome is something that's common for people like me, especially because they deem themselves as unworthy of their position because they're so underrepresented. And so how do you combat these feelings to convince yourself that you are, in fact, adequate and worthy of your accomplishments? So everybody feels this way. It affects some people more than others. I sometimes am like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, I can't believe I got this award, for example. And I, you know, just accept that feeling and move on. I think the important thing to do to combat imposter syndrome is if someone gave you an opportunity, it's because they believed in you. And I remember being in graduate school at Oxford University and my classmates and dorm mates were all in different majors. And they were much younger than me. I kind of let them think I was 26, but I was 36. And they all thought it, so it was fine. And I remember them being like, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. How did I get here? And I was like, well, don't you think that the faculty of Oxford University that chose you to be in this PhD program are smart? If they're smart, then they made the right choice. And so you doubting yourself is actually doubting them. And so I think, turn it that way. I think that's a really, really good choice. One of the things that fascinates me most about computer science is its ability to reach new heights with innovations and turn scientific fantasies into probable realities for the future. What are some of the developments in computing that you're most excited about? And as my peers and I prepare for careers in this field, where do you think the most compelling work is happening? Well, data science is super exciting because our ability with big data and and smart data scientists to find patterns that are broken and fix them um, is really powerful. So an example of that was a project that the White House did with, brought a whole bunch of data scientists and a whole bunch of police chiefs together to open their data. And with one particular police department found that there was a huge number of people who were being arrested and processed and incarcerated who were mentally ill. And it's bad enough to get into the cycle of incarceration, but if you're also mentally ill, getting out of it is very, very hard. And what they ended up doing was they looked at all the data and they discovered that this city was spending $8 million a year to incarcerate people who were mentally ill. Well, they responded to that now that they had the data and they could see it. And they 
instead trained the police officers to recognize mental health sim symptoms, built a section of the jail into a mental health ward, and they diverted them into the mental health system instead of arresting them. And that, a year later, it was down to like 700 people. And so that's not only saving those people's lives and their livelihoods, but it's also saving the city millions of dollars. Yeah. And that's what you can do with data science. It's really exciting. Um, I am also really concerned on the flip side about the potential impact of bias that's in mm. the technology that we use. And that's why I'm so passionate about getting young women and people of color and people with disabilities and different neurodiversities into building the technology because the technology is always going to reflect the perspectives of the people who build it. Yeah. And right now, frankly, most of the technology that we live and rely upon, live with every day, is built largely by white and Asian men, and they don't, they don't know what they don't know. So you can't expect them to build for everyone because they're not everyone. So we really need to accelerate the pace of bringing more diversity and more people into technology because AI is going to move things so fast. Already technology operates at a scale that's exponential. Mm -hmm. And we need to um, get people like you to the table as soon as possible. And that's why I'm just so fond of your work and everything you've done. I mean, just researching a racial bias and artificial intelligence was incredibly illuminating. And it showed me you know, the pressing issue of bias and how it can really, really impact someone's life. Because artificial intelligence, there's no question, it's burgeoning as a pioneer of the future. It's something that's going to be a part of us no matter what. And so if we have this artificial intelligence that is like harming people of color, there has to be something to do about that. And I'm so grateful that you are taking the initiative and making sure that women are, especially women of color, are coming into these fields and they're able to create a diverse workforce that can actually help to create products that are diverse within its capabilities and are not just saving, um, serving just one demographic. Yeah, that's super important. And I think that um, the best favor that you and young women like you can do is like, go get those credentials and learn and you know get your PhD in AI and um, help us make sure that the future is built correctly. It's an honor sitting with you today. I'm so thankful for everything you said. I'm just very, very happy that you came to sit with me today. Well, it was great to be here in this beautiful place on a beautiful day. <laughs> with that, we'd like to present you with the Launcher Future Award for all the work you've done in education and advocacy. Thank you, Angela. It's such an honor to be here, and I'm so happy to know that schools like Gala exist. For my generation, more than any before it, the media shapes our view of both ourselves and the world around us. From the very beginning, Gala recognized the importance of helping students find alternatives for the often narrow vision that the media has of women, especially women of color. But luckily for us, we have a champion who is in a league of her own. Gina Davis is a phenomenal Academy Award winning actress and the founder of the Gina Davis Institute in Gender and Media. Through its research and advocacy work and the idea that if she can see it, she can be it, the Institute has done the difficult work of changing the way that women and women of color are represented in stories on our screens, as well as working behind camera. We honor Ms. Davis with the 2022 Visionary Award for her pioneering work in helping us picture a future without limits. Hi, I'm Olivia Liu. I'm a senior here at Gala, and I have the honor of introducing our honoree, Ms. Davis, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Gina Davis. Nice to meet you, Olivia. It is amazing to be able to sit down with you. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I remember like watching your movies when I was little and then I'm reading about the institute that you founded and it's just like mind blowing everything that you've accomplished. Oh, thank you, thank you. So just a little bit about me. I am a senior here at Gala. So I am going to college in a couple of months, which is a little scary. But I'm really excited to be double majoring in film and child development at Mount St. Mary's. Fantastic. So that combination is just a little, um, tends to be a little unusual for most people when I explain it. But my dream is to be an animation producer so that I can tackle these taboo subjects that a lot of people avoid because they think children are too young to understand. So things like race and the LGBTQIA plus community and physical disability and neurodiversity, all of that. Right. I am just so excited to really bring that into this industry. 
And I know that you have also done a lot of work championing diversity and gender equality in with your Gina Davis Institute of Gender and Media. Right. So I'm curious about any challenges that you faced as you were founding this institute and as it kept working towards its missions. Well, uh, you know, data has been the key for us for identifying inequality for female characters in, in entertainment media. And, uh, and our solution is to, uh, to engage and inspire the industry uh, through a combination of our, our, you know, our research and uh, uh, deal, you know, interacting with the creators of the media uh, in order to um, in order to affect the change. The, really, the biggest challenge that we've had has been in raising funds to be able to um, pay for all the research that we want to do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a I'm a Girl Scout. And I'm doing my own project, so I know how hard fundraising is. <laughs> right. And then, you know, speaking of all the research and the work that your institute has done, you guys successfully achieved your goals of achieving gender equality and lead characters back in 2019 and 2020. Are there any new goals that you guys are currently working towards, or anything you are currently researching? Well, actually, yeah, we have achieved another goal, uh, which was to have parity for the secondary characters, the the other characters in the movie besides the leads, and uh, and so we we have achieved that in um, uh, TV shows uh, made for family, you know, family viewing, and uh, our future goal too is achieve uh, equity for all types of female characters, from you know intersectional uh, female characters, uh, people of color with disabilities, LGBTQIA, uh, older female characters, characters with large body type, you know, all those different categories of underrepresented, uh, women. Yeah. That actually goes into my second question about if you guys are working on anything for women of color, because we have women and we are a marginalized community, but then women of color tend to have their own unique experience. So is there anything else that is specific to that community that you're working on? Well, yeah, we um, every every research study we do, we include women of, of color. And uh, uh, so we've, we've uh, conducted a dedicated study also on black women and girls in Hollywood. And uh, we found that even though black girls and women are 6.5% of the US population, they're only 3.7% of leads and co-leads. And uh, this has been over the last 10 years and it uh, has improved in recent years. Um, so, uh, but only here's another thing we need to work on. Only one in five of black leading ladies uh, have been had a dark skin tone. Um, so um, they are, uh, and, and also most of the black leading ladies in popular films have uh, been depicted with hairstyles that conform to European standards as opposed to natural black, black hairstyles. Your institute actually is the only data-driven and research-driven um, organization that is working collaboratively in this industry. And I know in a previous um, interview I saw of you, you talked about how you, um, how you wanted to go into research because no one believed you when you mentioned the disparity of representation. So just can you talk a little bit more about why you chose to go into research? Yes, yes. So it was uh, it was because of my daughter, actually. She was when she was about two, I started watching uh, little kids, you know, pre preschool shows with her and stuff. And from the very first one, I noticed that there seemed to be far more male characters than female characters. And then I noticed it in uh, G and PG rated movies and I, could, I saw it everywhere. And I was so stunned that we would be showing little, the littlest kids that boys are more important than girls. <laughs> uh, because basically if, if you have more male characters and they do more interesting things, that's what you're training them. So it's like we're teaching kids from the beginning to have unconscious bias. So um, I, I didn't intend to you know, take it this far, but, uh, but as you said, I, I talked about it with people in the industry and I couldn't find one other person who said, yes, I know, isn't that a big problem? Um, everybody said, but that's not true anymore. That's, not, that's in the past, that's been fixed. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna get the data on this because I think I'm right. 
And if I have it, I can go directly to the creators rather than trying to educate the public or something. I could just go directly to the people making it and try to impact them. And uh, so it it proved to be the right um, tactic to, to try to make the change, uh, especially because people who make kids entertainment love kids. I mean, almost universally, of course. So uh, they want to do right by them. And, and they just didn't realize that they were not doing right by girls. So, um, so we, we've been able, that's why we've been able to make so much progress. Yeah, I think it's really eye opening when you look at this children's media, and you think about how impactful it is, because we're, we're I mean, we're teaching them things. This is why a lot of kids shows they have themes of friendship and kindness, because we're teaching them things, which is why representation is like even more important than we can really understand. And talking about your research and things that you've discovered, I'm actually doing my own research study this year because here at Gala, we teach two courses that are kind of non-traditional. We have AP seminar and AP research. And I spent almost all of my second semester writing a paper on how um, favoring Eurocentric features in media impacts the mental health of women of color. And I am conducting a content analysis on one of Disney's television shows to analyze how race is represented. And honestly, I think that gives me just so much more respect for all the research that your institute has done because research is hard, yes. but it but it reveals so much about this industry and it shows us like what we've done well and how we can improve and just how we can keep making better media. I'm just curious how this advocacy that you've engaged in, how has it affected your career? And do you ever feel like you need to stay quiet or like you're being silenced when you're talking about these kinds of topics? No. And, uh, uh, and, and I'll tell you why, um, because you can talk about these things without coming across as confrontational. Um, you know, uh, because for the most part, people are are doing it because they're not thinking about it. They didn't think about it, or or they have such strong unconscious bias that it didn't occur to them. And uh, so, to point point these kind of things out is is usually very very accepted. And I've I've not had any pushback from people because I'm not going in there saying, "How could you do this?" You, blah, blah, blah. I say, "I know you weren't aware," or have you thought of this or whatever? So, so I think there are ways to, uh, to get it, you know, easy, easily to get across what you're talking about. Now, whether you can convince them to always go as far as they should, you know, that's, that's part of it, but, um, you know, uh, setting a good example yourself, you know, but, but, uh, also just being, uh, very encouraging to people. Cause I think we really do have to face that, uh, that, a lot of people don't think they have bias. And the fact is we all do, men and women, because we've been trained to by our culture. Uh, so um, in order to rise above it, you have to become conscious that you have bias. And uh, so that's that's part of the of the road, I, I think for you ahead is to um, to be the person who reminds people about it. You know, uh, uh, you know, it may may be that oh, you're the diversity. Oh my God, you're the diversity gal. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess I am. But anyway, let's do better on this. So, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It's hard for people in this day and age to not say they're for diversity. You know. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, but I'm so uh, impressed by what you're doing and what your goals yeah. are. Uh, I, I know you're going to succeed. You have to <laughs> for it. That's great. Yeah, it is just a really exciting future that I've honestly, I've since I've been at Gala, I've been able to grow in because I remember like my freshman year, I it was just an idea I had and I thought it was a crazy idea. Why was I going to go in a film? And just every year since I've been here, I've been able to like dedicate more time to look into it. And again, with the research I've conducted this year, it has been a lot of work, but it's been really enjoyable and I've been able to learn so much. The thing is, you know, when once people see something, it becomes normal and, uh, uh, you know, becomes accepted and the norm. So, uh, so that's what we're trying to accomplish is have people see accurate representation or, or, you know, uh, uh, sensible uh, representation or uh, authentic and uh, 
because then people watching it can say, oh, like you said, you don't see people like you. You can say, there I am. Wait a minute. I must matter. <laughs> You're somebody like me. So, um, so uh, that's, you know, that's what's, that's what's important to us. Yeah. So, I mean, it has been such an honor to speak with you because, I mean, you were, I mean, you're amazing and just everything that you've achieved and you've worked towards is outstanding. And I mean, I love talking about this industry and representation and you definitely have a unique perspective on it. Um, But there was something that kind of stood out to me when I was watching a couple interviews of you. You spoke about being the tallest girl in your class just all the time. And I, I was always the tallest girl in my class. And I was like, oh, that's that's the same thing. I mean, I remember in kindergarten, I was, you know, I was taller than the girls and I was taller than the boys. And it's been like that my whole life. And I mean, it still kind of is here at Gala. I'm still taller than the rest of my classmates. Oh, <laughs> and you, so yeah. And you spoke about how, I mean, especially when you're younger, you're kind of hyper aware of the space that you're taking up and you, you almost want to shrink yourself down a little bit. And I think when you're older, that kind of translates into you're aware of your voice and you become kind of self-conscious about that. And I definitely experienced that. And I believe that you spoke about it too. But then, I mean, you went to go on and have this amazing career. You went on to play a star athlete in a league of our own. You were also a semifinalist in the US Olympic trials for archery, which is just like, it's like a list of things that you've accomplished and it's amazing. <laughs> um, so, is there anything like any advice or any moment um, in your life where you were kind of able to emerge from that bit of self-consciousness or those insecurities and anything you would like to say to like the little girls or just anyone else who's watching this? Well, I, I love hearing that you're also the tallest. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a unique position to be in. Yeah. Uh, especially also taller than the boys. It was very weird. Uh, yes. I was always quite shy about uh, myself and being so tall and taking up so much space and, and uh i you know that i became scared to voice my opinions and and uh and all that and um so i one for one thing when i stopped growing finally <laughs> i was like okay i can live with six feet i'm so glad i didn't keep going you know so uh uh but um, but yeah, it was really as an adult that I was able to say, okay, all right, now I can, now I know what I'm dealing with, and uh, I can, I can, uh, I can live with this. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a, it's just you know everybody has their thing in high school and, and growing up, uh, which is equally difficult for them, you know, and, uh, and so ours happens to be our height, but. Um, but, you know, you start to realize that uh, as an adult, that it doesn't, these things don't really matter as much as, you, as they seem to in, in school. In school, it seems for whatever reason, when we're growing up, uh, just by nature, somehow our, our inclination is to judge other, other people uh, harshly. Or you're different, you're different, that one's different. Maybe it's something in our, you know, internal wiring that we'd say, let's find the different ones and, and be unkind to them. But it falls away a lot when you're an adult. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is just amazing to hear. And again, you, you know, you went on and kind of persevered that and then went and did everything that you've done and you're continuing to work towards all these amazing goals. So, I mean, it's just very nice to hear. And I mean, that's all the questions I have for you today. It has been, again, really amazing to sit down and have this conversation with you. And with you. Thank you. I'm really happy to meet you. So from everyone here at Galler, we are so excited to award you the Visionary Award for everything that you have done with diversity and just inclusion in media. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm, <laughs> I'm very honored. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. The Founders Award is given to the senior best exemplifies our four pillars, excellence, wellness, honor, and leadership. The student this year for the class of 2022 who best exemplifies those pillars 
was given this award for excellence. She took 10 AP classes and has a 4.2 GPA as she's entering her final semester of her senior year. She has been in leadership in ASB. She helped to do our first Hispanic Heritage Month. And she also has been a leader in many other ways for her, her classmates. One of the things she did that so impressed me is in a ninth grade, she came to me and said, could we have a cheerleading team? At the time I said, maybe. And I said, you need to have enough students to verify the, the team. And within a day, she had enough students. She is the one who is the reason why we had a cheerleading club, and then it's gone into a cheer team. So she showed leadership and showed that she had integrity and honor as she moved forward with so many things at our school. She also showed wellness because she was a inaugural member of the um, lacrosse team and the cheer team. And she's just an all-around amazing person who has shown herself to be a leader for not only her, her two sisters, actual sisters at the school, but all of her gala sisters. She's an amazing candidate for the Founders Award. I'm so proud to announce this year's winner of the Founders Award, Audrey Talon. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's an honor to receive the award. I'm so proud of our school and what I've accomplished so I'm trying to hear. Thank you so much. Well, you deserve it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Angelica Gomez, Director of Fundraising at Friends of Gala. And I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us for Launch Her Future. I hope you've been inspired by the conversations with our students, our honorees, and our vision for world-class STEM education for our students. In the two years that my daughter has attended Gala, I've witnessed the amazing things our school is doing firsthand. Throughout elementary school, my daughter was not very confident in her math and science abilities. Today, she is thriving in math and has been placed in an accelerated math class. She is passionate about aerospace and learning about airplanes, rockets, and drones. At Gala, she has been encouraged to use her voice, engage, and be part of the conversation. She has been introduced to a whole new world of STEM subjects that have piqued her curiosity and encouraged her to explore more. Gala girls are bold. They are curious and compassionate, and they are incredibly hard workers. They are our future leaders. So we need to give them every opportunity to succeed, and we need your help to make that happen. As we mentioned at the beginning of our program, we've set a goal for, so that we can continue creating and scaling our STEM programs for the next five years, and to support our girls at GALA and beyond. To give you a few ways to support, I'd like to introduce to you Poe Gala Grants Director and fellow board member, Tara Hiramura. Thank you, Angie. Gala has a rigorous college prep curriculum that has resulted in 100% of our students receiving college acceptances. But with girls from over 80 zip codes around Los Angeles and a wide variety of socioeconomic levels, not everyone has the resources to go to college. That's why it's imperative for us to fund the Dr. Michelle King and Dr. Liz Hicks Founders Scholarships. The great news is that GALA is growing and thriving, but that means we need funding to support students' increasing interest in careers in aerospace, environmental science, and sports medicine areas where women, and especially women of color, are underrepresented. Today, you heard our students speak passionately about their fields of interest, including computer science, genetics, microbiology, and public health. 
Our school offers even more programs, including graphic design, architecture, and environmental science. At GALA, we want to do all we can to support their interests and passions in these areas. Our teachers work so hard. We are so grateful for the work that they do. And we want to be able to support them with the equipment and supplies that they need in the classroom. After all, you don't get to be the director of the LA County Department of Public Health or the Surgeon General without proper lab equipment. Ruth Farmer spoke so eloquently about the equity gap that occurs in computer science. Gala is determined to be part of the solution and to do so, we need funding for one-on-one -on -one computing. Just like Gina Davis, we believe that if she can see it, she can be it. And often school is the very first place that girls get to see themselves as belonging in the world of STEM. Gala is where they will develop the confidence and leadership skills they'll need to flourish in these rigorous careers. Your donations help to provide the operations and community support that each student needs to build their self-esteem and to pursue future careers in STEM. I'll speak plainly with you here. It takes $1,500 to support each student in middle school and high school through supplemental resources, tech tools, and programs that open more pathways to college and ultimately towards having more women in STEM careers. We wouldn't be able to make such an impact without gifts to help cover the costs of operating the school programs. If you've already donated, thank you for your generous contribution. If you haven't yet, it would mean so much if you considered giving a gift of at least $100 today. We've made it easy for you to donate. Simply click the donate button on this page. And of course, you can always find out more information about partnering with GALA and the Friends of GALA at our website, www.fogala.org. We hope we can count on you to make this event our best event ever. Thank you again for joining us today for Launch Her Future. Thank you all for joining us to discover what makes GALA such an innovative school. And to our honorees, thank you for sharing your personal stories and hard-won wisdom. As emerging STEM professionals ourselves, hearing directly from you about your amazing lives and careers is truly invaluable and uplifting. On behalf of our principal, Dr. Hicks, our incredible teachers and staff, the student body, and our supportive parents who make up Friends of GALA, we're so excited about the future and we are grateful for your partnership and support.